Um, I will call this next case. It's People versus Derek Meshkin. It's a 15 minute mini oral argument on the application. That means you each have 15 minutes and Mr. Dodge, you may attempt to reserve some of that for rebuttal. And if you're ready to proceed, please do. Thank you very much, Your Honors. David Dodge appearing on behalf of defendant appellant Derek Meshkin. And if I could, Your Honor, uh, reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Under this honorable court's June 25 order, I hope to address two issues. First issue was, was my client's constitutional right to present a defense violated when he was precluded from presenting the testimony of Dr. Daniel L. Post, child psychologist, head of the forensics division at uh, Pine Rest Hospital, regarding the diagnosis at an earlier date while the complainant was in foster care, she was diagnosed uh, with reactive attachment disorder. And Dr. Post's proposed testimony, and it was very carefully, uh, the effort was to very carefully uh, present it as taken right from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, Dr. Post's clinical and educational uh, experience, and not the trial court took it as medically diagnosing the complainant as a liar, which plainly was not the case. Dr. Post was very, very, very careful as the head of the forensics division to properly uh, limit what he was going to hope to present to the court. And the testimony was important for several reasons, Your Honor. One of which is classic symptom of reactive attachment disorder is the child's effort to control his or her environment. And part of the forensic uh, investigation the case indicated that the complainant had expressed that she would have liked to have been living with her friend Madeline and Madeline's mother. And it would have uh, been important to present that information to the jury in conjunction with the DSM uh, testimony from a well-qualified clinical psychologist who would have been, uh, been able to uh, present that information. Now, Your Honor directed us to, uh, on this issue, review the case of People versus Whitfield, criminal sexual conduct, conviction, trial court precluded Dr. Samuel Lerman from testifying regarding non-sexual transmission of gonorrhea, and this court reversed the conviction that Dr. Lerman should have been able to present the testimony. Your Honor. Mr. Dodge, Mr. Dodge, let me interrupt you because I want to make sure everyone has a chance to ask you the questions they, they have. So I'm going to start with Justice Bernstein. Thank you, Your good Honor. Morning. Good morning, counsel. I have no questions. Thank you. Justice Clement. Uh, no questions right now. Justice Kavanaugh. Um, is, this, is this constitutional error or just an evidentiary error? Your Honor, it's our claim that it's a federal and state constitutional issue. As far as the right to present defense, the case law that we're relying on is both federal and state, and also would be uh, supported by this court's decision in the Whitfield case in 1986. So did the Court of Appeals properly, or in your opinion, properly analyze it as a constitutional error? No, Your Honor. I believe that uh, it was presented that way in the trial court. Actually, Your Honor, the briefing that we have on the issue with the federal citations was presented in the Allen County Circuit Court as well as the uh, Court of Michigan Court of Appeals. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Justice Welch. No questions, thank you. Justice Zara. No questions, thank you. Justice Viviano. Uh, no questions. Um, Council, I'll just ask one following up on Justice Kavanaugh's question. There's, there, there, um, you know, obviously um, the question about whether um, the expert testimony was appropriate could be both an evidentiary issue and a constitutional issue, right? Sometimes that happens, and uh, especially with the Sixth Amendment right to present a defense, um, evidentiary rules often or, or can conflict with that constitutional right. Um, it, my understanding is your client wanted a Ginther hearing on this topic in the trial court. Is that correct? Uh, no, Your Honor. It, it, it was a uh, the press. We noticed out Dr. Post and his report as an expert witness. The prosecutor filed a motion in limine 
We had a motion in limine hearing in November of 2018 uh, with the offer of proof, both in terms of Dr. Post's credentials, as well as his report being uh, tailored to what would have been, we submit admissible testimony. And the trial court mistook it as medically, quote, medically diagnosing the complainant as a is a uh, liar or, or something along that line when it clearly was not, Your Honor. It, it was presented as uh, uh, to present a well-qualified witness who was going to stay completely within lines and within the boundaries in terms of DSM, established information, and it, it was not going to be anything close to what the trial court mistook it as. So if would it if the trial court was mistaken about that, would it have made sense for your client to have asked the trial court to hold again? I'm sorry, to hold a um, a hearing to determine whether that expert testimony was appropriate. I mean, well, Your Honor, the the hearing on November 9th, two thousand eighteen, was that hearing. Uh, we submitted the report as uh, the content of what Doctor Post would be testifying to. And there was no issue that uh, it was basically whether or not you know, the, the court should grant the motion in limine and the prosecutor's motion in limine. And we did it via report and uh, see a curriculum vitae. And there was yeah, no objection. I'm, just, I, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm just at a, at a full blown Daubert hearing, the judge could have taken testimony and heard the prosecutor's objections and made some determination about whether it's proper, um, the, you know, this particular scientific testimony is proper under the Daubert rules, correct? And, and your honor, in that regard, we never got that far because the court precluded it based upon the prosecutor's motion in limine, even though the report and the CV we submit uh, indicated that it not only was, uh, should have been presented on uh, MRE 702, but there, there was a uh, uh, a sufficient basis, both in terms of expert qualification as well as the topic. Okay, um, you may continue, and at a certain point, if you want to reserve some of your time, please do. And so that I can do that. Oh, wait, I didn't. Oh. I didn't give Justice Viviano a chance to ask questions. Oh. I take it back. Quiet down. One second. My fault. Okay. Sorry, Justice Viviano. Uh, I have no questions. Thank you, Counsel. Okay, you can keep going. My fault. Okay, Your Honor. Let me turn to the second issue directed by this court in this uh, June twenty fifth order. That is the cross-examination of my client's father, Albert Meshkin, in the court directing us to the Dorica's case, the Washtenaw County case, 1956 case, where uh, the defendant uh, uh, was the defendant's character witness. Cross-examination included uh, background information. Your Honor, our argument here we would submit is uh, much, much, much better than Mr. Derekas's argument. Number one, Albert Meshkin did not testify as a character witness. His testimony was related to my client's injuries while he was a teen, uh, necessitating uh, air evacuation, the University of Michigan Hospital, and tracheostomy procedures, which uh, resulted in severe physical limitations. And Mr. Meshkin Sr.'s testimony was related to those injuries and the limitations, as well as his observation of the care of my client of the complainant. He did not testify as a character witness, Your Honor. Uh, Derekas, the case is uh, based upon the United States versus Mickelson, uh, the uh, component of the Whitfield case were on retrial. Uh, the the cross-examination was not to occur uh, of, of the care. All of those involve character witnesses. My, my client's father was not a character witness. Secondly, Your Honor, all of the cases, whether it's Derekas, the component of the Whitfield case that addresses this issue, the Mickelson case that they both are based upon, all had reputation testimony from a witness. Question, have you heard about a receiving and concealing arrest? Have you heard about... The cross-examination here was, isn't it true that your son fondled his sister when she was 10 years old? It was not a proper question under any of those cases. So not only was he not a character witness, the way that the witnesses in the other cases were, 
presented as character witnesses, whether truth and veracity, whether it had to do with general character. It also, the form of the question in and of itself was improper, even if he had been presented as a character witness, the question would have been, have you heard, rather than, isn't it true? So that, it, and then to further, uh, in the Mickelson case, which Derekas and, and Whitfield both go back to the U.S. Supreme Court case, the trial judge was careful to ascertain that there was some historical basis to the cross-examination. In Mr. Meshkin's case, in the case at Barr, the trial court precluded us from presenting testimony from Nicole Hamer or Christine Thompson, who both would have testified, and it's in our offer of proof very specifically, they were both available, that my client never fondled neither, either one of them. So not only do we have a non-character witness being cross-examined with uh, improper cross-examination, not only do we have the form of the question being totally out of bounds, isn't it true, quote, end of quote, and number three, we could have presented the testimony that would have told the jury that neither of these ladies back when they were 10 years old was fondled by my client. So, Your Honor, if I, so that I can reserve, I'll stop there and so they don't go beyond my time limits. You may reserve the rest of your time, unless anybody has a question right now. Okay, you may reserve. Ms. Shakura. Thank you very much. Good morning, Molly Shakura, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney. Uh, with respect to the argument about reactive attachment disorder, I'm not suggesting that categor categorically testimony about reactive attachment disorder should always be excluded. However, if it is permissible in this case, then that would be tantamount to a finding that it is categorically always admissible. And the reason I say that is that without reference to any facts um, indicating the basis for uh, a, a different doctor having made a finding that the victim had been diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder when she was approximately five years old, Dr. Post indicated, <clears throat> excuse me, that he would testify that 20 to 30 <clears throat> percent, pardon me, of kids who are in foster care have reactive attachment disorder. The kids with reactive attachment disorder lie more than their peers lie, that a feature of reactive attachment disorder includes a propensity to lie. And as to the lying, he indicated that exact statistics do not exist related to the frequency of that behavior. So in my mind, as I look at this issue, it's the precise obverse of the court's ruling in uh, People versus Thorpe, at least, the whole point of the testimony proposed was to have Dr. Post vouch that statistically speaking, this victim is not credible. So in other words, he identifies a whole host of behaviors that are associated with reactive attachment disorder without reference to the specific behaviors exhibited by this victim that, um, that constitute her personal um, attributes that are related to rea reactive attachment disorder. So I am arguing that the testimony would be irrelevant under Michigan Rule of Evidence 401, that doctors, uh, Dr. Post's report says that you don't see features of reactive attachment disorder, generally speaking, after a person turns nine years old although you would with a different disorder that there was no information the victim had been diagnosed with. The victim was 12 when she disclosed the sexual abuse. Uh, and again, irrelevant to the extent that we're not clear what behaviors gave rise to the diagnosis on the part of this victim. There was information at the hearing in July where the issue was first addressed that Mr. Dodge was trying to determine the name of the therapist who had diagnosed this reactive attachment disorder. He subsequently 
was able to identify her by name, but there was no additional information, no um, assessments submitted, no uh, reports, or even any argument about what features, other than the fact that this child had been traumatized when she was three and before, that contributed to her having been diagnosed. Ms. Shakur, let me interrupt you and see what questions my colleagues have, okay? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Justice Bernstein. I don't have any questions, thank you. Justice Clement. No questions. Justice Kavanaugh. Um, so as I heard, I think you've, you've said that, that RAD or evidence of RAD is not categorically inadmissible um, or an expert testimony on that. Um, so if that if that's true, why why wasn't there a Daubert hearing where the offer of proof, and I think it's paragraph four, said having not evaluated the adolescent or either adoptive parent, it will not make any evaluate or I will not make any evaluative statements regarding the veracity of her claims, the accuracy of the diagnosis, or any other facet related to the facts of this case. Isn't that basically what Peterson asked for? I mean, isn't that exact? Isn't that consistent with Peterson? It is. I'm not understanding your question. Is what consistent with Peterson? The, what what Doctor Post uh, put in his affidavit at paragraph four, his offer of proof. And I guess if that was an offer of proof, why why at a minimum? And you're saying, well, it shouldn't have been here. Why do we not have a Daubert hearing to ferret that out? What you say, the points that you're making here. Just reading through the transcript of the motion hearing, the issue of the Daubert hearing came up. And while Mr. Dodge had suggested the court might want to have a Daubert hearing, he did not request a Daubert hearing. So I assume that that's why a Daubert hearing wasn't scheduled. So but I also... So it's not that it would have been inappropriate, it's that he didn't ask for one, it's a preservation issue, is that what you're... Well, I think it's partly a preservation issue. The other, the, the other issue I believe that's even more significant is the 403 issue. And I'm not saying that to suggest that rules of procedure trump, or rules of evidence trump um, constitutional considerations, but because I think there's a genuine public interest in making sure the trial focuses on what the trial needs to be focused on. So to the extent that under Peterson and Beckley, there was going to be a suggestion that this child categorically was a liar merely by virtue of having this diagnosis without us knowing what the basis for the diagnosis was. And I, it's my, not my understanding that Dr. Post ever proposed to examine the child. So to the extent that your question goes to that, it's my understanding that, that Dr. Post was only going to make general commentary on reactive attachment disorder, that he wasn't going to be for instance, um, second guessing the original therapist records, he was simply co commenting on reactive attachment disorder as a, as a phenomenon. And based on the fact that sometimes those kids have um, a, a history to manipulate or, or lie, that that was going to be his testimony. Okay, so so can you answer me what I'm what I'm struggling with? Um, and maybe you can you can articulate what is the difference? Um, you know, why is it that the there's testimony, and I think it was Mr. Cottrell in this in this case, but it's 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 common in in these cases about having an expert testify about delayed disclosure, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they can't testify that, you know, this is why I believe this mm -hmm. victim, but here's the nature of a dislay, a dis, you know, delayed disclosure. Um, and here's a reason why, despite the fact that there was a delayed disclosure, it doesn't mean necessarily she's un or, or, or a child who delays disclosing is necessarily untruthful, right? I mean, that's the purpose of, of, of an expert 
testifying to that, again, not wading into the area of, of vouching for the veracity of this particular complainant, but providing the jury information about why something that they might think would, would make the victim un, unbelievable shouldn't be. Why is Rad not sort of the flip of that coin? Saying like saying, you know, here's here's why, here's why, you know, um, again, not testifying whether you think this child is being um, honest or not. Um, but here's a here's a diagnosis and here's what that means. You know, rad and delayed disclosure are sort of the flip of the other side. Why is why we shouldn't look at rad in that regard? As as I understand the the cases that give rise to testimony, like what Mr. Cottrell testifies to, those cases are meant to, for lack of a way to articulate this better, to remove the distraction of things that are common misperceptions. So for instance, we would expect the six-year-old to pick up the phone and call 911 as opposed to delaying until she's nine and they move to a different, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. So I guess what, I guess what I'm suggesting is that there is a distinction between testimony um, that a category of persons is incredible as compared to situations that um, that should, shouldn't, you know, to remove that distracting issue so that you can focus on the issues in the case. And so I think if you, if you follow what I'm saying, it, Right. But I mean, there is some aspect of delayed disclosure that goes to to believability and truthfulness of the complainant. Right. Absolutely. And okay. that, and I believe that that's why, you know, it's pretty common fare for defense attorneys on cross-examination to elicit that Mr. Cottrell hasn't um, spent time with these people. He hasn't made his own diagnosis and he can't make any judgment about whether or not in this particular set of circumstances there they're telling the truth or not. So I don't believe you ever are removing credibility from the discussion of delayed disclosure, but you're also understanding a separate context where, where sometimes that can happen. So, okay. and, and, and there's not that balance in this particular aspect of, of testimony, nor does it relate as far as we know to what happened with this particular youngster in terms of the features that she was exhibiting. Okay. Um, thank the, you. Thank you. And the other Justice, Justice Welch. You're okay. muted, Justice Welch. You're muted, Justice Welch. God, we're failed today by all of us. So, so, so uh, thank you. Um, so just to pick up on Justice Kavanaugh's questions, uh, you talked about uh, with testimony, um, you know, in CSC cases about delayed disclosure that uh, defense attorney, it's fair game, they cross examine. I mean, isn't that couldn't that be the case with uh, a reactive attachment disorder expert as well, you would be able to cross examine, isn't it? Aren't they pretty similar? I, I don't. So t some aspects are pretty similar. And I think that they're that that is why there is, um, that's why I'm saying I, I wouldn't argue that, that it is categorically inadmissible, but- So then and, when would it be admissible? Gosh, well, um, not in this case, but I, but it, I don't know because I've thought about that as, I, as I've considered these issues. So, for instance, I was looking at some of the other features that Mr. Dodge had identified in his report as that these are areas that we would have explored if we had been allowed to have Dr. Post testify. So for example, there were a number of things that I believe there was very specific testimony about that things that were um, in evidence in this case that went to the issue of reactive attachment disorder um, 
that were perfectly admissible, but there was no need to identify it as a phenomenon of reactive attachment disorder. So for instance, the issue of night terrors, that information came in. That is something that I know anecdotally, not based on Dr. Post's letter, can be associated with uh, can be associated with reactive attachment disorder. And so there was testimony that AM had night tears. Um, so in this case, to the extent that her credibility was an issue, there were defense witnesses who testified that um, she had a reputation for um, not being credible, for example, that um, she had stolen food and hoarded food, which was another consideration that Mr. Dodge was suggesting would be a reason why this red testimony would be um, important. So I guess what I'm saying in the, in the balance, there are some things about RAD that were relevant even in this case um, that we know AM did. We, okay. don't know, we don't know that based on the history at the time she was diagnosed. Um, but Okay. I want to just, because I want to be respectful of time. I do have one more question. I want to jump to the second issue in the case. Um, and I just am wondering, um, I, a, attorney Dodge um, spoke about the fact that uh, the defendant's father was not presented as a character witness. Um, and I, I'm just wondering what was the prosecutor's um, basis for asking the father about questions about his, uh, whether a defendant had fondled his sister. Um, um, there was a, it's my understanding in terms of the where that information came from, it's my understanding there was a reference in the original investigation report um, related to something that had, or a series of events that had happened with Mrs. Meshkin's sister when she was a minor, and that that was the basis for the question. Um, I, I do believe that on that issue, the context is going to be absolutely critical. So for example, Mr. Dodge asked, um, uh, just reading from the transcript, ever see anything that kind of caused you as a grandfather or father to say, hey, Derek, you should think, you know, that doesn't look good or change things or anything like that. So um, there, Mr. Meshkin didn't testify as a character witness um, concerning the defendant's character for truthfulness, but he did testify consistent with the four witnesses who preceded him with Mr. Meshkin's character for appropriate sexual boundaries or good sexual conduct. And Judge Kengas gave an instruction along those, those lines um, un, unimpeded. And in Mr. Dodge's opening, he argued, you're not going to hear anything about anyone who has any concerns that Mr. Um, Meshkin is, is handsy or that he has any kind of viol boundary violations. He's not the kind of person that you get those sort of creepy vibes from, I'm paraphrasing. And then in his closing, unfettered, he went through that, that, that same recitation. This isn't a person who you will hear did or you have heard has done anything to a kid who is 10 years old or 12 years old or whatever. So I, in, the, in the context, including in the context of the judge's instructions, which I think was one of the um, marked differences between this case and Doricus and and I beg your pardon, when I got the order uh, requesting supplemental briefing, I had understood what Whitfield was being requested for comment on that issue. And yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, that, that, thank you for your answer. I want to defer to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Justice Zara. No questions. Thank you. Justice Viviano. To quickly follow up on that point uh, on the second on the second issue, isn't it important for us to know whether 
the uh, assistant prosecutor had a good faith basis for asking that question at all. Otherwise, it would be pretty egregious uh, conduct to throw out a question like that in a trial like this, would it not? Candidly, I don't love the question. I do think it arguably would fall into 404B territory. There was no record. Which, which as, a former, as a former trial judge, I would have gone bananas if a prosecutor threw a question like this out in front of the jury without us having a conversation about it ahead of time, which of course is what 404B requires, obviously, but apparently also does the, the case that we referenced in our order. But if the prosecutor didn't have a good faith basis, I mean, not only is it egregious in terms of the conduct in the trial, but it uh, would be unethical. There's all kinds of problems with it, right? If there's not some basis for it. So I looked at your brief because I assumed you were going to say, here's what the basis for the question was, and I didn't see it there. Was I missing something? It, it, no, Your Honor, simply the, the fact that it was not flushed out in the trial court. So the, the fact that she didn't comment on the basis made me feel constrained not to, not to present that information to the court. Um, so, it, but I, I do think the context is important. You didn't, so you even, sound, even, so. You didn't it, sound, I mean, I, I acknowledge we're apparently operating outside of the record because the trial prosecutor, when the issue was raised, didn't provide that basis, which I also found to be striking. But from but from your answer today, it sounds like even as you sit here today, you think it might have been referenced in some investigative report, but I wasn't getting from you that you were giving us some clarity on that. Was, was the issue in a police report or was it not? The, it, the issue, as I understand it, went to poor, poor boundaries. And it wasn't the children themselves or the child herself who raised the issue. It was an adult who was watching his interactions with the child and felt that it was, um, he had his hands on her more than she thought was reasonable based on their relationship. And who was the adult and when, and how was the, how did the information come to the attention of law enforcement? It was in the course of this investigation. It's my understanding that the adult was the uh, defendant's mother-in-law and that it was her sister who, uh, I haven't reread it very, very recently. It's my recollection. She was approximately 10 years old at the time. They were um, all living in, in the same home. That's pretty, pretty uh, attenuated. But in it, in, I mean, Seems to me if that had come up in front of the court, the judge would, of course, have said, no, I'm not going to let you get into that type of an allegation. But in, in any event, that's all that's all I have. Sure, I do. I don't. I do want to um, go back to the issue of context with respect to that question. Council, council, I'm going to uh, unfortunately we've used way more than your time. So oh, we're gonna have to, but I appreciate your appreciate your hanging in there for all those questions. Um, I'm going to go back to Mr. Dodge for his rebuttal time. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Your Honors. And quite frankly, Your Honors questions have uh, already covered two of my main rebuttal points. Number one, on the uh, expert witness and the rad cross examination. We proposed Dr. Post as a witness, prosecutor filed motion to eliminate. All the issues the prosecutor is raising right now could have been covered by cross-examination uh, of Dr. Post. Secondly, MRE 404B notice. If there's something that's going to be uh, claimed that's of that variety, the prosecutor should have filed a 404B notice. If so, whether it would have been the claim that as, isn't it true that my client fondled his 10 year old sister when my understanding of their age and Christine Thompson would have testified to this if the, if the court had allowed it was that she's older than my client. So when, when she's 10 years old, he would have been six years old. As far as the sister-in-law goes, Nicole Hamer was proposed as a witness for the court to hear these two witnesses. 
And to hear whether from Christine Thompson, my client's sister, or from Nicole Hamer, as we proposed, it was my understanding and the offer of proof was that they both denied there being any type of fondling or that type of behavior by my client. So cross-examination on the expert witness issue, topical issue under Whitfield, notice 404B notice on the kind of like, I, I, I don't even want to say the pejorative, quite frankly, but throwing that uh, out there. Now, it's our claim that both under Whitfield with respect to Dr. Post and under Dorikas with respect to the cross-examination issue, my client's arguments are a fortiori. Whatever arguments Mr. Whitfield had that this court adopted, that he should have been able to present the expert witness, Dr. Samuel Lerman, it's our submission that our argument is a fortiori, both in terms of there had been a diagnosis while the complainant was in child care, in foster care. So it's not as though my clients, uh, our witness is saying, maybe this, maybe the complainant was diagnosed. We tried on the first discovery hearing to have the court order background on that. The courts basically said, because all we all, all I had was my client's adoptive parent records. We didn't have other records that subsequently we ascertained it was a uh, licensed master social work person. I actually spoke with her and she confirmed the diagnosis. So it wasn't as though we were out there claiming something might have happened. Uh, we had a very well-qualified witness and the topic was inbounds is our claim, just right out of DSM. Secondly, on the Dorikas issue, uh, the whole, isn't it true to a non-character witness and the total lack of any type of record support of the claim we would submit is much stronger than Mr. Dorikas's arguments that he had before the court, which the court accepted and reversed his conviction. It's like the court accepted Mr. Whitfield's argument on the expert witness front and reversed his conviction. So we're asking the court to do the same outcome here on either or both grounds based upon what we claim are stronger reasons than either Mr. Whitfield or Mr. Dorica said. I, I see that I'm out of time, but I, obviously if there are questions, I'd be more than happy to stay in session with the court, but I know you've got other matters on your docket. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Any additional questions for Mr. Dodge? Thank you both. The case will be submitted. Thank, Thank you. you.